I'm very happy to introduce Richard Davison, who's a, a collaborator and friend, one of the leading persons in applied uh, holography, uh, well, holography in general. And he's going to talk about, uh, okay, let me first say that Richard is staying the whole, well, until Thursday included, right? That's right, yeah. He's staying right here, so. And he's going to talk about quasi normal modes and police keeping. Okay, so yeah, first of all, let me say it's great to be here in person to get a seminar. And um, after such a long period of not being able to do that, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some work um, that I've been doing mainly in collaboration with Mike Blake, who's in, in Bristol University, and also with David Begg, Sasha Grossenov, and Hong Liu. Um, yeah, and so at a kind of basic level, this talk is about quasi normal modes of black holes. Um, and more specifically, it's about um, certain general properties that these have. Um, and what this tells us about um, the general properties of quantum field theories uh, via ads cft correspondence. Okay, so uh, as you, sure you all know, uh, black holes are thermodynamic objects, so they have a temperature, they have an entropy, and so on. Um, and for certain types of black holes, so black holes embedded in anti desistor space-time, um, we can be more precise about this. Um, and via the ADS-CFT correspondence, we can identify these black holes or some of these black holes uh, with the thermal states um, of certain strongly interacting quantum field theories uh, with a large number of degrees of freedom. Um, okay, so when we perturb a black hole, it will undergo some compl complicated dynamics and um, before eventually relaxing back to its thermal equilibrium state. Um, and it's important that we understand um, how this happens specifically. Uh, so one reason for this, um, as we can now observe, you know, various interesting dynamical properties of black holes um, through the gravitational waves that they emit. Um, so in order to interpret um, these observations, it's obviously very important that we understand the theory behind it very well. Um, more specifically, for ABS black holes, this relaxation back to thermal equilibrium corresponds to the relaxation of a quantum field theory back to equilibrium uh, once it's been um, perturbed. Um, and understanding how this happens um, is important for understanding the physics of heavy ion collisions at the LHC, for example. Um, and it's also important more conceptually um, just you know, to give us an understanding of what are the properties of quantum field theories um, far outside the normal perturbative limit um, where we can study them using Feynman diagrams and so on. Okay, so I think I probably anticipate these dynamical processes that eventually lead back to equilibrium um, are very complicated and they're not so easy to understand. Um, and the kind of obvious uh, practical reason for this um, is that Einstein's equations, um, which govern what's going on, are complicated PDEs. Um, and in almost all situations, they can only be solved numerically. Uh, and this is usually relatively difficult. Uh, there's another difficulty, which at least in my mind is slightly different from this one. Um, which is the, the way in which this relaxation to equilibrium happens um, is highly sensitive to the details of exactly which black hole it is we're talking about. Okay, and so, um, you know, for example, in terms of the Einstein equations, you know, the, right, the, the solutions, the solutions to them depend obviously on what, you know, what stress energy terms we have on the right hand side of the Einstein equations, it depends on what the initial conditions and so on and so forth. So this kind of multiplies the practical difficulty uh, of solving this problem. Okay, now this sensitivity to the initial conditions um, for planar, sorry, for ADS black holes, and um, we can also understand in a quite straightforward way. Um, and that's that if we have some strongly interacting quantum field theory and we perturb it and um, eventually it relaxes back to equilibrium, then the precise way in which it does this depends you know, in great detail on exactly which quantum field theory it is we're talking about. So what are the microscopic degrees of freedom of that quantum field theory? You know, how do they interact with one another? And so on. Okay, and since different quantum field theories correspond to different black holes, and this is kind of the field theory way to see you know, why these things are sensitive to the details of the space time. Okay. Well, you say infinitely many parameters, even in the dynamics. Yeah, so let me come on to this very last point. So ads cft does help us out a little bit for understanding the equilibration of ADS black holes. Um, and that's because um, if we think in the field theory language, um, so eventually our state's going to reach some global thermodynamic equilibrium. 
But before it does so, you know, what we expect is that you know, before it reaches global equilibrium, is it will locally equilibrate. So small regions of space time will equilibrate due to the interactions between the particles in those regions. Um, and so if we probe it over very long time scales and long distance scales, much longer than the ones over which this local equilibration has occurred, then we should expect the black hole um, to behave like a locally equilibrated state. Okay, and we have a you know very well-known theory which describes locally equilibrated states, um, and that's the theory of hydrodynamics. Okay, and so at least for ADS black holes, there's some regime where we can use ADS CFT to conclude that we expect them to, to, be, to behave um, to be governed by hydrodynamic theory. So this is you know somewhat of a help, but it doesn't completely solve the problem because the theory of hydrodynamics depends on infinitely many parameters like the viscosity and so on and so forth. Um, and the values of these parameters are inputs to the theory. So the values of these parameters depend on exactly which quantum field theory are we talking about? What are the microscopic degrees of freedom? How do they interact and so on? So even in this limit, um, you know, there's still um, still a, a large sensitivity to exactly which state it is we're thinking about. Does that answer your question? Daniel, so here I'm thinking in hydrodynamic yeah, theory. Infinity, you mean if you go to infinite order in height? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about one relatively simple aspect of this relaxation to equilibrium, um, and that's what are called quasi-normal modes. So quasi-normal modes of, of a black hole um, are just a characteristic set of excitations of the space time. So more specifically, these are solutions to the equations of motion for small amplitude perturbations around a black hole space time that satisfy some given boundary conditions. So the simplification here that I'm going to be making is always looking at small amplitude perturbations around some black hole. And in ADS black holes, uh, via ADS-CFT correspondence, uh, these quasi-normal modes and have a very direct meaning. Um, the spectrum of quasi normal modes corresponds to the spectrum of collective excitations of that quantum field. Okay, so these are, in general, very different than the, the microscopic degrees of freedom. You know, the, the microscopic degrees of freedom interact very strongly, and the, you know, the, you know, the sort of real excitations of the quantum field theory are these collective excitations. Okay. But even these quasi-normal modes, uh, which as I mentioned, involves a simplification to small amplitude perturbations, uh, in almost all examples, even these have to be calculated numerically. And even these are sensitive to the precise details of which black hole it is we're talking about. Okay, so this um, simplification doesn't really get around um, these problems I mentioned. Yet. Okay. So uh, let me start by giving you a kind of summary of the, of the results that I, I want to explain. Um, so the first thing I want to explain um, is that quite surprisingly to us, and kind of despite everything that I just said, uh, there are certain features of the quasi-normal mode spectrum of a black hole, uh, which are governed only by the dynamics near the horizon of the black hole. So more precisely, these, are, these certain features of the spectrum are completely independent of what the space-time looks like away from the horizon. And what this means um, for ADS black holes um, is that there are there are the, that the collective excitation spectrum of quantum field theories that have a gravitational description exhibit certain characteristic features, which again are sensitive only to what's happening right near the horizon, are independent of the rest of the space time. So this is like the first part of what I want to explain, um, and then I want to use this um, in the second part to talk, um, and what I want to um, how I'm going to use it uh, is I'm going to point out you know, the reason this is so, so uh, turned out to be so useful for us is there are certain aspects of the dynamics near the horizon of a black hole, which are more or less completely independent of which black hole it is you're talking about. It basically looks the same for all black holes. So there's some universality um, in the near horizon dynamics. And we can combine that with this result above um, to conclude that you know, a huge class of quantum field theories, uh, which have a gravitational description, all exhibit this universal feature um, in, the, in their collective excitation spectrum, uh, which is completely independent of exactly which quantum field theory it is that we're talking about. Uh, and physically, what this relation um, means, how it should be interpreted, um, is that there's a universal relation between the collective excitation spectrum, quantum field theories have a gravitational description, um, and the more what are called chaotic properties uh, of these quantum field theories. I'm 
can start with this, this first part and just talking about black holes um, and describing or explain to you how we can extract certain features of the spectrum causing our modes, which uh, only depend on what's going on in your horizon. Okay, and I'm going to try and keep things very simple, at least to start off with, and talk about um, very simple examples. So with that in mind, um, let's think about a certain black hole space-time, which is the planar, Schwarzschild, black holes, and ADS in some general number of dimensions, d plus two. So this is a planar black, black hole solution. The gravity with a negative cosmological constant uh, has a metric written in the form here on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, here's a sketch of the space-time. So R here is a radial coordinate. When R is very large, we're near the boundary of the space-time, and the space-time looks like ADS. As we go, as we decrease R and go into the space-time, this function F decreases. And then there's a value, a finite value of R, which I call RH, where F vanishes. Um, and there we have an, a, an event horizon, a planar event horizon um, for the black hole. Okay, so this is the example to have in mind um, from now on. Okay, so in these coordinates, uh, this metric, uh, the, the R component of the metric is singular at the horizon, and this is a pane. Um, and so to get around this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change from the ordinary time coordinate to an Eddington Finkelstein like coordinate B. So this is just an ingoing null coordinate. Um, and if I write the metric in terms of these coordinates, and this coordinate singularity in the metric goes away. Okay, so from now on, I'm going to be always working in this coordinate system. Okay, so this is my planar black hole. And if I wanted to compute the quasi normal modes of the metric around this black hole, what I would do is take my take my metric, take my black hole metric, okay, turn on a perturbation around it, compute the equations of motion for those perturbations from this action, and then solve them to linear order in the amplitude. Okay, and from that, I can extract the closing model modes. Okay, even that is a little bit complicated, okay, because the metric here, there's lots of different components of the metric, the Einstein equations couple them all together and you get some complicated set of couples. EPEs. So let me do something even simpler, just to illustrate the basic point. And that's not look at perturbations of the metric, but just put a probe scalar field, built up psi with some mass m into this black hole and study its perturbations. Okay, so here we'll be computing the quasi-normal modes of this scalar field rather than of the metric. Okay, so we can Fourier transform this scalar field, okay, okay, to give us some function phi, which depends on the frequency conjugate to V, wave number conjugate to X, and the radial coordinate. Okay, and after the Fourier transform, this equation of motion just becomes a second order ODE for this field in the radial coordinate. Okay, and the second order ODE has two independent solutions. Okay. Now, if we look near the horizon of the black hole, we can give a straightforward interpretation to what these two different solutions are. So there's one solution, which is called the ingoing solution, which in these ingoing coordinates I'm using, is regular, so it just has some Taylor series expansion near the horizon. This corresponds to something falling into the horizon. The other independent solution is called the outgoing solution. Okay, this does not have a Taylor series expansion near the horizon, it has some strange power here. This corresponds to a mode coming out of the horizon. So these are the two independent solutions near the horizon. We can also look at the two independent solutions near the boundary of the space time, so when R is large. Okay, and we can characterize these. Well, the two independent solutions scale in a different way with R. So one of them is called the non-normalizable mode. That's the one that grows fastest as R becomes large. It grows with R in some particular way. For delta here, it's some function of the mass, which is not particularly important. And the other independent solution is called the normalizable solution. Okay, and it goes lower near the boundary and it scales in some other way. Okay, so the quasi normal mode, in this case of the scalar field in the Schwarzschild space time, corresponds to sol solutions of this equation of motion, which I just wrote down, that are ingoing at the horizon and are normalizable at the boundary. Okay, so hopefully it's obvious that in order to determine what the quasi normal modes are of the space time, we have to solve a boundary value problem. So we need to know what is this ODE, the solution to this ODE, everywhere between the horizon and the boundary. So that we can impose boundary conditions at the horizon and at the boundary. Um, and so let's compute the quasi-normal node, quasi-normal modes. We have to know that ODE solution everywhere. That depends on exactly what does the black hole space time look like everywhere between the horizon and the boundary. 
And that's why the spectrum of these things right, depends in great detail on exactly which space time it is you're talking about. Okay. So for some generic frequency and wave number, we can take our ingoing solutions, the solution that's ingoing at the horizon, okay, and expand it on a basis of the solutions of the non-normalizable solution, a normalizable solution near the boundary. Okay, and so in general, we'll have some linear combination of these things for the coefficients a and b um, are some functions of the wave number and frequency um, that depend on the space time we're talking about. Okay, and in this language, the condition that a solution is a quasi-normal mode is that this coefficient A vanishes. So for certain frequencies and certain wave numbers, this, this coefficient A will vanish. That tells us our ingoing solution is normalizable, and that's a quasi-normal mode. Okay, so typically in order to find the quasi-normal modes, you know, we have to find these solutions numerically and find what the frequencies and wave numbers where A vanishes. And what you'll find is that for some given wave number k, will be some discrete set of quasi-normal modes, okay, which each have a complex frequency. So here on this plot, I'm just sketching an example taken from this paper. This is quasi-normals of a massless scalar field in ABS5 short field. So when k is zero, so for perturbations that have zero wave number, these dots here show the first five quasi-normal modes computed numerically. Um, and there'll be some, you know, infinitely many of these. Uh, I'm just showing the first part. Is it for a day that it's always going to be a discrete solution? Uh, no, no. So, yeah, so these kind of statements I'm making are based not that I have a kind of formal proof of this, but just, you know, in the vast majority of examples, including all the ones I'm going to talk about, um, there is a discrete set of close models. I think it depends, it depends on the nature of the singularities and the differential equations. Right, yeah. So typically, these ones are function differential equations with whatever yeah, thing yeah. points. And I think then you're almost guaranteed to get discrete points. But when you have uh, essential singularities, then probably get branch cuts. Yeah, yeah. So, so for extremal black holes, you can certainly get branch cuts and yeah. things like that. Um, so there is an So everything I'm talking about is, is finite temperature. So there's so non extremal black holes. Um, but even for extremal black holes, there is kind of generalization of, of what I'm talking about. But, but I'm not going to explain it uh, today. Yeah, so this one K is zero, right? We turn on K, right? These modes move here. I'm just showing the real part of the frequency. Okay, and they trace out some curve omega of K, right? With the, the dispersion relation of the quasi normal. Okay, so this is just, you know, these dots are just approximations to a continuous length. Okay, so that's what quasi normal modes um, is for this very simple example of a scalar field in a short field space time. And now let me explain um, exactly what this corresponds to in the quantum field theory. So um, the, the SCMT correspondence uh, tells us that each field in, our, in the gravitational description of the theory uh, corresponds to a particular operator in the quantum field theory. So, for example, the space time metric um, tells us information. Uh, about the energy momentum tensor operator of a quantum field theory. Or if we have a scalar field like the one we're looking at, that tells us information about some scalar operator in our quantum field theory. Um, so more precisely, perturbations of a field, so in our case, perturbations of a scalar field, um, so linear order of the amplitudes, tell us about the response and the expectation value of the quantum field theory operator when we turn on a small source part. Or even more precisely, the ingoing solutions for perturbations of a field tell us the retarded Green's function of the operator in the quantum field theory. Okay, so if I find my ingoing solution for some scalar field phi, decompose it in terms of its normalized or non normalized and mostly other boundary, these coefficients B and A, then the ratio of B over A tells us the retarded Green's function of this scalar operator in this thermal state of a strongly interacting quantum field. Okay, so quasi normal modes are the ingoing solutions for which A is zero. And um, so that means the frequencies and wave numbers at which we have the quasi normal modes and tell us the frequencies and wave numbers at which the retarded Green's function of our quantum field theory has a pole. Okay, so this is what I mean by collective excitation. The field theory, I mean, this is the dispersion relation of the poles and um, of the Green's functions of operators in the quantum field theory. 
Okay. Yeah. And so in general, as I said, these frequencies are complex. So if you do a, the, the inverse Fourier transform in your head, the real part of the frequency tells us the, you know, the real propagating frequency of this collective mode. And the imaginary part of the frequency tells us how it decays in time. Okay, so here we're in some thermal state, the excitations decay with some finite lifetime. And the imaginary part of the frequency tells us what that is. Okay. So this is a kind of crash course in what the polynomial mode and what the mean in the CFD. And apologies for the experts, it's just extremely boring for you. And now I want to move on um, and explain, um, again, in this very simple example, um, the certain features of this spectrum actually depend only on what's happening near the horizon. Um, and, and really, it's very simple to see um, how this works. So I'm going to stick with this probe scalar field example just to keep the algebra a bit more manageable. So what I'm going to do is let's first of all make an answer of looking for a solution which is ingoing at the horizon. So let's just try and construct near the horizon a solution which is ingoing. What I'm going to do is after Fourier transform my field, I'm going to make some ansatz of some Taylor series expansion near the horizon, substitute this into my equation of motion, and then expand that equation of motion near the horizon. Okay, so the first, you know, the, the first term I'll get in is expansion of the equation of motion. Um, is this thing here. Um, and so this fixes, I solve it, the value of phi one in terms of phi naught. Okay, the next order, there'll be some other equation which fixes phi two in terms of phi one and phi naught, and so on and so forth. And so if I just solve this order by order, what I'll find is there's a unique regular solution like this, um, or unique up to the overall normalization of the field phi naught. Okay, so this unique solution, which is regular, is the ingoing solution. Just constructing it in a very basic way. However, what you can see just by staring at this equation here is there are special values of the frequency and the wave number for which this equation just vanishes identically. I can choose the frequency so the left hand side vanishes, I can choose the wave number so the right hand side vanishes. Um, and so at this special point in Fourier space, or at least in the complexified version of Fourier space, okay, this equation identically vanishes. Okay, phi one is no longer fixed in terms of phi naught. Okay, so if I construct my ingoing solution in this way, what I'll find is a two parameter family of ingoing solutions. Okay, phi one and phi naught are both just arbitrary constants. And what this means is that this special point in, in Fourier space, in fact, both solutions to the equation of motion are ingoing. Okay, so contrary to what I told you before happens in the generic case, right? What's special about this? is both solutions are now ingoing. This is a bit, I mean, at least if you're used to dealing with polynomial modes and so on, this is a very strange thing. Um, and so to understand a little bit better what's going on, well, let's move infinitesimally away from this strange point of Fourier space, okay, by perturbing the frequency by some small amount delta omega and the wave number by some small amount delta k. So now I'm no longer exactly at this point, this special point in Fourier space. So phi one is now fixed uniquely in terms of phi naught, okay, just from solving, solving this equation. Okay, we can solve for phi one in terms of phi naught and get some unique expression. The important thing to notice about this is that the precise value of phi one over phi naught right, depends strongly on how exactly I move away from this point in Fourier space. So it depends on right, what is delta k over delta omega. I change this, I'm going to get a very different solution. Um, and the ingoing solution is going to look very different based on exactly how they move away from this point. Okay, so if I, if I take a solution like this and decompose it in terms of some linear combination of normalizable and non normalizable modes, what I'll find is you know, for some, some value of this slope, I'll get some particular combination, right? Some particular coefficients here, right? But the exact coefficients I get depends strongly on, on the direction I choose, depend on how do I move away from this point. Okay. And as I mentioned, delta k over delta omega is arbitrary. I can move in any direction I want. And that means there's always some direction I can move in, right? For which the non-normalizable coefficient is just zero, right? If I move in a certain direction, this will always be zero. Um, and that means there's always some direction I can move in close to this point, which the ingoing solution is normalizable. Okay. What 
what this argument shows um, is that there has to be a quasi-normal mode passing through this spatial point in Fourier space um, where both solutions are ingoing. Okay, and this gives me a constraint that there must be a dispersion relation passing through this point omega one and k one in Fourier space. Just yet. Yeah. So, just from looking at the boundary conditions near the horizon, what we can extract is an exact constraint on the spectrum of quasi normal modes. Or, in the language of quantum field theory, there's an exact constraint on the spectrum of collective excitations. Okay, I don't, and I, I don't need to know anything about what the rest of the space time looks like. I can just look near the horizon and see aha, the quasi normal, quasi -normal mode spectrum is not arbitrary, has to obey these conditions. Now, in the QFT language, we can be a bit more specific than this. So if we go back to this general form of what the ingoing solution looks like near this special point in Fourier space, okay, to extract the Green's function in the dual quantum field theory, what I'm going to do is take the ratio of the norm, the coefficient of the normalizable mode to the non-normalizable mode. Okay, and if I do that, I find that near this special point in Fourier space, my retarded Green's function has to have this characteristic form. C, B, Z, and B, P here, these are just constants that depend on details of the near horizon of the black hole. Um, but the functional form in terms of frequency and uh, wave number has to look like this. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, first of all, it tells us that exactly at this point, omega 1, K1, the retarded Green's function is undefined. Okay, if I set delta omega and delta K to zero, this is just zero divided by zero. This is just some. It's just undefined. Okay, and the reason it's undefined is because there is no unique ingoing solution. Right? The fact that the ingoing solution um, is non unique means we cannot extract right? a number for the retarded Green's function, it's just undefined. But more precisely, what it means okay, is close to this point in Fourier space when delta k and delta omega are non zero, we're going to have a line of poles, we're going to have a dispersion relation of some pole passing through this point. It's coming from the denominator. We're also going to have a line of zeros, okay, with some other slope, bz, passing, passing through this point. And so, in terms of the retarded Green's function, this special point in Fourier space corresponds to a point where the whole of the Green's function intersects the zero of the Green's function. Okay, and that's why it's undefined. Okay, and for this reason, this special point is called a pole skipping point. Okay, because it looks like you have a pole, and suddenly it disappears because there's a zero. Okay, so um, were there any questions about this? This is kind of the very simplest example of how this, how this works. These are the definition of the green function. If I really do something that should measure. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you would, yeah, you would, if you try to sort of measure the green function at this particular point, you would, yeah, I mean, it, it's undefined. So, so the real space green function is fine once you free transform this. It looks weird in frequency space, yeah. but in real space, it's, it looks okay. It looks okay. Yeah. So there's no experiment that I can think of that weird things will happen. Like, uh, and I, I mean, I, I don't know. So there, I mean, I would like to know the answer to that question as well. Is there a kind of, for example, in real space? Yeah, is there some, yeah, characteristic signature I can look for and what this means function? Right. What did I see near a full skipping point? Um, but I, yeah, I, I don't know the answer. So um, yeah, so just a uh, point um, for, since I know you know a lot about hydrodynamics, you know, right down, I mean, this, when we were first writing down things like this, we also thought this looks very weird and kind of should be the case, but if you, so in hydrodynamics, if you have like a conserved charge diffusing, right, the Green's function, Apologies to the people online who probably can't see this. Looks like this, right? This is also undefined at the origin, right? You set k to zero and omega to zero, is zero divided by two. And the value of this depends on how you approach the origin in Fourier. So this is this is like one very specific example of this this kind of point, yeah. You know. But, but real space, right, the green function just looks fine.
Okay, yeah. So this is a, a simple example of a scalar field in short field reflex. Okay. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg. So if we do a more complete analysis, right, just look more carefully at these trying constructing these ingoing solutions near the horizon. So not just looking at the you know the, the first equation and the series of equations I wrote down, but look at each of them order by order. What you'll find is there's actually infinitely many constraints like this. So there's infinitely many points in this Fourier space um, where the ingoing solution is no longer uniquely different. Okay, so these are spaced uh, evenly um, in frequency. Um, so yeah, they're spaced in units of minus i two pi t for every positive integer n, um, and for certain, for, you know, for each frequency. Oh, yeah, so let me say that the number of wave number, so the number of points, the number of pole skipping points grows with n. Okay, so when n is one, the example I just talked about, there's one with a, there's pole skipping at one wave number. Okay, at the next frequency, there's pole skipping at two different wave numbers, and so on. And so on. High, higher and higher frequencies of more and more and more of these points. Um, yeah, and I'm not writing down the specific values of k because um, they're not very uh, helpful, at least to me. Okay. But this is completely generic or just for the case of a scalar in the uh, So this is completely generic. So let, um, for now, I'm just talking about a scalar, but I'll get to other fields in a sec. Okay, so just to illustrate this to you, let me think about the simplest example <clears throat> there is of this class I've been describing, so that's a scalar field in BT. So this is a three-dimensional version of the space time I just discussed. Okay, so I... Here I picked the scalar field to have some specific mass, right, which corresponds to picking operators of some dimension and in the quantum field theory. Um, and we can do this near horizon analysis and identify these points. And here they're plotted. So here I'm plotting imaginary frequency against the imaginary wave number. Okay, so when omega is minus i2 pi t, there's two of these pole skipping points, when it's minus i4 pi t, there's four, then there's six, then there's eight. This is just what I get from doing this um, simple. Uh, near horizon analysis, you get a huge tower of um, points like this. Yeah, and the reason I want to show you this one is this is, you know, essentially the only example or one of the only examples um, where we can solve the perturbation equation exactly, right? And so we can test everything I just told you, we can check it's really true. So for this example, we can solve the perturbation equation exactly, we can extract you know, a closed form expression for the retarded Green's function. Um, and it looks like this um, complicated combination of gamma functions. Okay, and so from this, we can extract where are the poles of this Green's function, where are the zeros of this Green's function, and we can just plot the dispersion relations on this same graph I had a second ago. Um, and you can see that, as I claimed, right, everywhere where we have these weird points um, in Fourier space, um, there's an intersection of the dispersion relation of a pole um, with the dispersion relation of a zero. So if you like, this is kind of like a sanity check of what I was saying in the example where we really know what the Green's function looks like. It really is undefined at all these points, um, and it really does correspond to where a whole intersects with a zero. Okay, so, so, so this, in this example, this kind of analysis I've done is kind of superfluous. Just let me emphasize that. If we already know exactly what the Green's function looks like, right? that analysis I did before, we don't really need to do it. But the real utility of this uh, near horizon constraints is that it allows us to figure out properties of the spectrum in much more complicated examples where it would be extremely complicated to, to calculate the Green's function exact. Okay. So that was a scalar field. And I just talked about a scalar field um, because the simplest um, kind of example but can do the same for any kind of perturbation in the Schwartz field ADS space time. So we can define a quasi normal mode in an analogous way. It will be some ingoing solution um, which has some. Uh, normalizable boundary condition at the boundary. Um, and we can do the exact same near horizon analysis. So the equations of motion are a bit more complicated, right? It depends on exactly which field it is we're talking about. So we'll find this exact same feature that there are certain frequencies um, and wave numbers at which um, the Einstein equations are automatically satisfied. Um, and um, from that, we can extract constraints um, and, and the locations of pole skipping points. Okay, so in general, some spin S perturbation has pole skipping points that are again evenly spaced in imaginary frequency. Um, and what the spin controls is what is the highest frequency at which this happens. For a scalar field, S is zero. So the pole skipping points are all minus i multiplied by a number. Okay, and as you increase the spin, 
right? This tower, tower, tower has in the previous slides starts higher and higher up in this case. Okay. And again, uh, the number of wave number, I'm sorry, yeah, the number of wave numbers at which you have these pulse skipping points grows with n. Um, and unlike the scalar field case, in which this k was always imaginary, okay, so I was doing some, I'm always doing some analytic continuation to imaginary k, right? In general, k is not always imaginary. So in some cases, it's just real. Um, so in these cases where it's real, um, you know, we can really think of, you know, dispersion relation in the conventional way of a frequency as a function of real wave number. Um, and these pulse skipping points really place constraints on what those look like. So here's an example where um, k is real. So this is perturbations of certain components of the metric in four-dimensional Schwarzschild space-time. Um, and so the quasi-normal modes of the metric uh, tell us about collective modes of a certain um, component of the energy momentum tensor in a three-dimensional CFT. Okay, so this is, uh, like the trans this is like the momentum density operator in a quantum field theory. Okay, so I can just do this at the algebra near the horizon um, and I can extract from it these locations like with stars. Okay, and say there has to be this person relation, right? Or the collective mode of this operator which passes through these four points. Okay, there's infinitely many of these and just four. Um, and for this example, we can do some numerics and really compute exactly what is the dispersion relation of this mode for right? so these black dots. And you can see, okay, there is a mode whose dispersion relation really does pass through all of these points. Um, and this mode is kind of an interesting one. So this is this is to do with dynamics of the um, momentum density, um, a very low wave numbers and low energies. Momentum density is a is an almost conserved object. It's um, one of the variables of the theory of hydrodynamics. And um, so using what we know about hydrodynamics, um, we know at very low energies there has to be a mode with this dispersion relation, where d and gamma and all these coefficients are some undetermined parameters. Okay, so we know close to the origin this has to be quadratic. Um, and so this pole skipping analysis kind of gives us complementary, um, yeah, gives us kind of complementary constraints that tells us these coefficients, d and gamma and so on, these cannot just be arbitrary numbers, right? These have to be tuned in such a way that the dispersion relation is going to pass through all of these points. Okay, so yeah. So this again, yeah, this example is a bit more interesting because k is real. Um, and because um, it's connected to hydrodynamics. Okay, so the key point in what I explained so far um, is that the near, just from looking at what's happening near the horizon, we can get exact constraints on the spectrum at energies of order of the temperature. Okay, I've been talking about the Schwarzschild ADS space, space time just because it's relatively simple. Okay, but there's nothing special about the Schwarzschild ADS space time in this. You get exactly the same kind of thing, um, as I'll talk about later in black holes supported by matter. Okay, also, they don't have to be planar, it's just simpler for my purposes. Um, and also, as it's hopefully clear from the talk, it also doesn't matter if these are asymptotically ADS or not. I mean, all we're looking at is what's happening near the horizon. Okay, the key thing is that the ingoing solution is not unique. Okay, and that, right, that's completely independent of what the, right, your boundary is. You know, asymptotically flat or ADS or <laughs> if you're not asymptotically ADS, the definition of QLM as order of the retarded wave function. Yeah, so this interpretation in terms of quantum field theory that depends on asymptotically ADS. But if I just think about the quasi-normal modes of a black hole, right? These these constraints, you know, if we didn't know anything about ADS yet, you are constraints on the spectrum of quasi-normal modes. Um, and again, I mean, I haven't worked this out in detail, but I'm sure in a non ADS space time, it would be exactly the same phenomenon. As soon as you're able to send to zero, the non normalized, the normalizer was so much in thought. Yeah, so the, the, the key thing is the ingoing solution is, is, not, is not unique. So, um, I, so I can make, you know, I have two independent solutions near the boundary. They're both ingoing at the horizon. And so, you know, I can make a solution which asymptotically has any properties I want and is in going at the horizon because everything's in going at the horizon. So kind of the definition of what's a quasi-normal mode will be different, the boundary conditions, but it doesn't matter how I define it. I can always satisfy it because both solutions are in going. Yeah. 
So one question you can ask um, is, okay, I have all these exact constraints now on what my dispersion relations look like. Can I use this to determine properties, either exactly or to bound them, properties of strongly interacting quantum field theories in the hydrodynamic mode? So with the previous slides, to so try and make more precise what I've said here. If I know my dispersion relation has this functional form and has to pass through all these points, can I extract information about D and gamma and these? So these are D corresponds to like how how quickly momentum density diffuses. I mean, these are real measurable physical um, observables and, and can we extract information about them just from uh, this simple analysis. So I'm not going to talk about that, but it has been some interesting work about that. Um, Instead, what I want to explain to you, um, as I mentioned near the start, um, is that there are there's another aspect of the dynamics of the quantum field theory, which in the gravitational description only depends on what's happening near the horizon. And that's called the chaotic moments. Those are called the chaotic properties of these quantum field theories. Um, and since both of these things only depend on what's happening near the horizon, you might think there's some connection between them, and it turns out there is. Uh, so there is a universal relation between um, locations of pole skipping points and certain Green's functions um, and these chaotic properties of quantum field theories, um, which I'm now going to explain. Uh, yeah. So like, you have alpha now. Alpha now. Yeah. I think no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, with the leg 20, 25. Okay, I mean, I don't think I'm going to need a whole half an hour. Yeah. Okay. And most of yeah. Okay. So let me explain briefly what do I mean by these chaotic properties of a quantum field theory. Um, so chaos, uh, a chaotic system, heuristically, is a system um, in which if you make a small perturbation to that system at some point in space at some early time, then that will have a very big effect um, on properties of the system at some distant point in space at some later point in time. It's kind of heuristically what we think of as a chaotic system. So one way this can be kind of quantified in a quantum field theory um, is by correlators of this form here. So thermal expectation value of the squared commutator of two operators, B and W, which are some generic operators in my quantum field theory, which each only involve a small number of degrees of freedom of the entire state. Okay, so this, this commutator is a measure of, you know, if I perturb my quantum field theory, some small part of it, position X and time zero, what effect does that have on my later measurement of some operator at some distant point in space and time? Okay, so this correlator turns out to be a very useful way um, to characterize this, these chaotic properties. And in theory, if I have a gravitational description, an ADS gravitational description, um, the value of this correlator is related to a scattering process in a two-sided version of the black hole. So more specifically, it's related to the scattering amplitude in which we have two particles falling into a two-sided black hole from some early time. Um, what the scattering amplitude is um, to get in the outstate two particles um, a much later time at the two asymptotic boundaries. Okay, and so um, what happens is these two particles, since they're falling into a black hole, they get highly boosted relative to one another. Um, and the, by the time they're interacting close to the horizon, they have such high center of mass energy that the gravitational interaction dominates. Um, and so the value of this correlator turns out to be universal. That is, it doesn't depend on exactly which operator V and W we're talking about. They interact gravitationally. Um, and so the form of this correlator um, in gravitational theories, at least planar gravitational theories, um, always has this form. So it grows exponentially in time, okay, over some characteristic time scale which is set just by the temperature of the horizon, inverse temperature of the horizon, and it decays exponentially in space. Okay, and this growth in time and decay in space, you know, gives some, uh, you know, some growing region in which these chaotic correlations are non-zero, um, and that region grows at velocity VV, uh, which is called the butterfly velocity. Okay, so in this sense, uh, quantum field theories with the gravitational description are very chaotic, right? Because these correlations grow exponentially. And in fact, um, yeah, the, the time scale over which they grow is the maximum possible. And that, you know, heuristically makes sense because you think if I have a quantum field theory in which everything interacts very, very strongly with everything else, right? It's not surprising that if I make some small, small perturbation, that's going to have a big effect on the rest of the system. Like the theory more chaotic, what should we see? 
Well, I mean, yeah, it may not grow exponentially in time, it may grow like a power law, it may not grow at all. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this form is, is, is not, you know, this correlator does not always grow exponentially. It's in gravity, it grows exponentially, and it grows exponentially at some universal rate, which depends only on the temperature. Um, and, yeah. But the value of this velocity, that depends on the particular theory we're talking about. Let me be a bit more precise about that. So let's think about um, black hole space times that are not just four kilo EDS anymore, okay? But they're 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 sourced by right, where I start with gravity coupled to a U1 field, <coughs> Maxwell term, and some scalar field, um, and we can have some you know, relatively general gauge coupling Z um, and potential for the scalar field V. Okay, so now for some you know, with some weak conditions and what V and Z actually are, okay, this action. Um, has you know huge families of asymptotically ADS planar black hole solutions supported by um, non-zero electrical fields and or um, radially dependent scalar fields. Okay, so we have the metric has you know has this general form, and to find out exactly what the metric is, we have to choose exactly which matter fields we're sourcing and uh, solve the equations numerically and then construct you know, all the big families of black holes. And what this corresponds to um, in the language of the quantum field theory is we're looking at quantum field theories that are conformal in the UV. We're turning on some relevant deformations um, for various different operators. Then there'll be some complicated RG flow and we'll have some where it's non-conformal and because there's some complicated RG flow. Um, and depending on exactly which gravitational action we start off with and exactly which matter fuels we turn on, um, this corresponds to different quantum field theories with different RG. Okay, so for a phase kind of like this, the butterfly velocity has actually quite a nice form. Um, so it depends, so it could be written, if we write it in terms of the spatial component of the metric near the horizon, H of R, can be written in this very simple manner. Okay, so kind of the way, a helpful way of understanding this is, um, in general, you might expect, the, right, Properties of properties of the quantum field theory should depend on exactly which matter fields do we turn on and exactly what, you know, we're turning on some relevant operators, exactly what are their values and so on. And of course, the butterfly velocity does depend on all those things, but the way it depends on them is solely through the way the matter fields back react on this component of the metric near the horizon. Right? All the information about this complicated RG flow and the matter fields in the butterfly velocity just get packaged in terms of the metric. Okay, so just to emphasize, if I were to write the butterfly velocity as a function of all these um, relevant operators, it would be, well, I couldn't write it, it'd be some horrendous thing I'd have to calculate numerically. But in terms of the metric, it gets packaged in this nice way. Okay, and so it turns out that these chaotic properties, so this time scale tau L and this velocity, the control, this chaotic correlations in the quantum field theory, are universally and quantitatively related to pole skipping and the energy density Green's function of my um, quantum field theory. Okay, so to determine what where are the pole skipping points in the energy density Green's function, I just do what I did for the scalar field, but now I look at perturbations of the metric of the space time itself. Okay, so the principle is the same. In practice, this is much more complicated because perturbations of the metric coupled to all the other components of the metric coupled to all of the matter fields. Um, and so, you know, these perturbation equations and the quasi normal mode spectrum, right, depends in great detail on exactly what matter fields am I turning on, what black hole space time I'm talking about, and so on and so forth. However, if I look more closely at the Einstein equations, one of them um, is extremely simple. If I, just, um, if I just look near the horizon, one of these Einstein equations becomes very simple. Um, so it has this form here. So I have my metric perturbations on the left-hand side, have my sources, my matter field sources on the right hand side. They and almost obvious just from staring at it, I turn on these you know, relatively general set of matter fields. What I'll find is the right hand side, the matter contribution just vanishes. It's exactly zero on the horizon. Okay. 
So this Einstein equation on the horizon actually is completely independent of the matter fields, right? Assuming I started off with the action I did. Okay. And so then again, just from looking at the left hand side, I can identify a whole skipping point. Okay, just by looking where these two terms in brackets match. And what I'll find is there is a whole skipping point, this location, right? It's independent of the matter fields that I just said. The frequency just depends on the temperature, and the wave number just depends on the derivative of this component of the metric in the horizon. Okay. And now, if I just compare this to these chaotic properties, um, I can see that in you know, all this big class of gravitational theories, there's a pole skipping point in the energy density Green's function whose value is just universally related to tau L, the rate of growth of chaos, and BB, uh, this butterfly velocity that controls um, how chaos, how quickly chaos spreads. Okay, yeah, so this is kind of the second main result um, that I wanted to get to. But um, yeah. in general, a quantum field theory of the gravitational description, um, its um, chaotic properties right, are quantitatively encoded in just the retarded Green's function of the energy density operator. So um, what this is, is telling us, um, and uh, it's, I guess, I mean, it's, it's not really, at least in foresight, it's not really obvious, um, is that there's some connection between the chaotic growth of these um, four-point functions of generic operators and just the retarded response of the energy density operator. Um, and the way, the, so there's a very good interpretation um, given, of the, given of this, which is that the reason, um, so, yeah, so in field theory language, um, the way to think about that the, this, um, these chaotic four-point functions have this universal form, right, or independent of which operators are we talking about, as well as many, many details of the quantum field theory state, um, is because there's a simple effective theory governing them. Right? In all theories of the gravitational description, there's a simple effective theory governing these four-point functions. Um, and in particular, the fact that they all grow exponentially at this universal rate and decay exponentially in space um, comes from the fact uh, or this behavior um, just comes from exchanging a single effective degree of freedom sigma, where this effective degree of freedom is essentially just perturbations of the energy density. Right? So the reason this, yeah, for this universal form is because there's a very simple effective theory and a simple mode in this effective theory controlling everything. And that mode is the energy density. So these chaotic properties, if you like, are just inherited from properties of the two-point function of the energy density. The two-point function of sigma is related to the retarded green energy density, and that's the thing which is controlling the four-point uh, correlators. Um, so yeah, so we can so energy density is a, is a conserved quantity. We can write that in hydrodynamic theory for it, um, and these authors showed that if we take the kind of most general hydrodynamic theory for fluctuations of energy um, and impose a, an additional shift symmetry um, on one of the fields in this hydrodynamic theory, then that produces exponential growth in the chaotic correlators um, at a rate which is given exactly by the location of the pole skipping point in the two-point function of energy density. So this is, yeah. Sorry, you said it, but this shift symmetry is... So there is a... Oh, it has to be there, or is it there? No, no. So there's a so sigma here is a kind yeah, is a, 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 a mode which has some action um, whose equations of motion are the equations of hydrodynamics. This is some some field in the theory of hydrodynamics, and you can write you know based on symmetries you know the general action for a mode of this type. Um, and if you impose on that action an extra symmetry, which is a shift symmetry, what you'll find is is if you couple it to operators in an appropriate way you'll get exponential chaotic growth at a rate um, and a velocity, which is set by the pole skipping point in the two-point function of the energy. Yeah, okay, it's fast. It's break, so, but what, is there a physical reason for this? It's in, because there is a primary. What? No, no, no. So, this, so it's not some fundamental requirement of hydrodynamics. It's if I would like to have exponential growth via this yeah. mechanism, I have to have a shift symmetry. And so the, the way I, I mean, we don't understand why. 
Well, I mean, I get, I mean, the way, or at least the way I think, I think of, yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess the way I think about it is this is some additional symmetry that all quantum field theories with the gravitational description has. Right? It's not a theory of, it's not a ship symmetry that has to be there um, in general in hydrodynamics, but it's a symmetry that has to be there if you want your hydrodynamic theory to have a gravitational description. Yeah, so in that sense, it's not a kind of basic physical requirement because, of course, there's lots of quantum field theories which don't have a gravitational description, don't have this symmetry. Um, but this is, if you like, this is what's special about the theories of hydrodynamics, which do have a gravitational description. Yeah. So the kind of the basic idea here is the chaotic properties are inherited from just from the properties of the two-point function, and that's why there's this, this connection. Okay, you can also look at this conversely. So if you like to think about the chaotic properties, they're kind of more microscopic, if you like, as they're the kind of fundamental properties of field theory. And if you think about it conversely, right, you can see actually the chaotic properties constrain the hydrodynamic properties. So for some given butterfly velocity and um, time scale tau L, right, if I'm given them, then that tells me, right, that constrains my theory of hydrodynamics. It's no longer arbitrary, right, but it has to have Right. Dispersion relations have to pass through certain points and um, uh, Fourier space, um, and this can be, in some cases, this can be converted into giving exact constraints um, on individual hydrodynamic parameters. For, for example, in certain theories called SYK models or certain kinds of black holes, we can really see the rate at which energy diffuses is given exactly by some combination of these chaotic parameters. And it's coming from the same mechanism. Okay, so this relation um, is more general than just th this particular matter action that I wrote down. This is just a kind of relatively general one, but you can look at more complicated black holes that have some magnetic charge. You can look at higher derivative um, corrections to the gravitational action. So those correspond to finite coupling corrections in your quantum field theory. Yeah, you can look at space times on the horizon, it's not planar, okay, and you not always have the same connection. Uh, you can also do an analysis, right, not in holographic theories, but just in certain simple enough um, quantum field theories, for example, one plus one dimensional CFTs or these certain um, field, field theories of these quantum mechanical models called SYK chain models, um, and these also exhibit the same property. Okay, so it's more general than just what I explained. Of course, it's not completely general. I mean, there's many cases where this exact connection uh, does not work. Um, and the, so, the, yeah, the, so it certainly fails in cases where the quantum field theory is not what's called maximally chaotic. Okay, so that means if this time scale and um, it's not the maximum, right, it's not the minimum possible, um, the QFT is called not maximally chaotic. Um, and in those cases, this exact relation between pole skipping and the value of tau L and VB um, begins to get corrections. So this, this is really a property of what are called maximally chaotic quantum fields. So if you take these SYK chain models and move away from strong coupling to weak coupling, right, this exact relation begins to break down. But it doesn't take higher derivative gravity because there is a finite coupling. Yes. Yeah. But there it holds. There, yeah, there it holds. I don't know. Here it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't get correct. No, no. Here, here, it, here it fails. Yeah, yeah. Here it fails, but instead in higher derivative gravity, it continues to hold. Yeah. At least in some regime. Yeah, I don't want to say completely general. Perturbative higher derivative gravity. Okay, so then in the last uh, five minutes or so, let me briefly mention uh, another generalization, which at least to me was uh, much less trivial, um, and that's to uh, rotating black holes. Okay, so everywhere I was looking at um, uh, planar black holes, um, which as I mentioned before, to some degree near the horizon, all look similar to one another. Um, but something a bit more non-trivial is a rotating black hole like the Kerr ADS black hole. So this corresponds to looking at a quantum field theory on a sphere, okay, and this, this kind of metric, uh, where S here is like the cosine of theta, where theta is the 
orbital sphere angle on the sphere, and phi is the equatorial angle. So states on a sphere and um, with some non-zero temperature and some non-zero angular velocity. Okay, so this is some quantum field theory state which is has some non-zero angular momentum. Uh, now for this type of space time, um, we can calculate you know, these nice closed form expressions um, for this chaotic correlator um, in general. Um, but what we can do is in certain limits, uh, get access to what it looks like. So if we take a limit where the temperature is large right, in units of the size of the sphere and look just at the correlations in the equatorial plane, so between the two operators on the plane of this rotating sphere, um, what we find is this um, chaotic um, Correlator grows exponentially in time, right? As, as written here. Um, and then there's some other functional dependence on the time and the angle, um, F, which, which comes from solving some complicated second order um, equation uh, in these angles X and Psi. Okay, so there, you know, there's no closed form expression for what this looks like, or at least we couldn't figure out what it was. Um, but in principle, right, we can write formally this is what the chaotic correlator looks like in terms of the solution to this differential equation. Okay, and even in this complicated case, um, there is, yeah, well, even in this case, there's still a connection um, between the linear response of the energy density in the quantum field theory um, and the form of this chaotic correlator. So, um, more precisely, the energy density response is undefined, but this is the analog of the full skipping point for perturbations in the energy density, so perturbations of the metric, okay, whose spatial form, right, so they grow exponentially in this ingoing coordinate, and then they have some complicated spatial dependence, and provided the spatial dependence on the horizon, right, is a solution of this equation. Um, uh, then the energy density response is on the fact. Yeah, so for rotating black hole, this connection between um, the form of the chaotic correlator, right, and this um, hole skipping, if you like, un undefined um, response of the energy density, there is still a connection, which you can write in this complicated mathematical way here. Um, but when the form of the metric on the horizon is a solution to this differential equation with this differential operator L, um, so the energy density response is undefined for angular profiles of this type, okay, where L is the same operator which sets the form of the chaotic group. Okay, so. Uh, so, yeah, so the butterfly velocity, right, in principle would come from the form of this, right, but this F no longer is some simple function that decays exponentially in space. So, so, I mean, in general, this, right, the form of this is not exponential growth in time and decay in space. It's something more complicated, coming from solving some complicated uh, people. Well, at least far away, it has to decay. Uh, over, well, yeah, so over some range, it would do. But I mean, now we're periodic in space. So at some point, you have to take into account this periodicity. Yeah. So, yeah, so let me just say this. So this slide is there is some, there is still a formal relation, although. Right, you know, since we don't know what the functional form of this is in general, um, we can't write write it so nicely in general. But there are certain limits where we can, you know, still extract things in a very direct way. Okay, so the limit, or the limit in which we can do this is let's look at the limit where the black hole rotates slowly. Okay, so this angular velocity is not zero, but it's small. Okay, so in this limit, we can extract what this correlation function looks like. Um, and again, so now it grows exponentially in time, okay, and decays exponentially in along the equator. Um, and the precise rate it grows in time and the precise uh, speeds, again, this analog of butterfly velocity right now depends on the separation of our operators in space time and how that relates to the speed capital. Okay, so this. But this VB already looks So, so this is, this is the. This is just the outcome of the calculation of what is the what is this chaotic correlator. So um, it grows at some rate, which I call t plus or t minus, and then it spreads the space at some vb plus or vb minus. Okay, and if I like the precise values of those um, are related to how fast the black hole is rotating. 
So that's these two expressions. So VB dot here is some function of temperature. This is the butterfly velocity, the non-rotating black hole. Uh, okay. And then as, as the, right, the black hole rotates, right, this functional form changes, it's more complicated. Now there's a T plus and X minus. And now there's two butterfly velocities. So it's one corresponding to whether you're operating, you know, how, how exactly are your operators set? But this is only in the slowly rotating way. This is only in the slowly rotating way. Okay, so in general, the form is given by the solution to this complicated PBE, which I'm not, not even writing down because it's looks very complicated. But in the slowly rotating limit, we can solve this PBE and get the form of this function. Okay, and we find now there's, if you like, there's two different growth rates and there's two different butterflies. And this slowly rotating space time or the normal modes now have dispersion relations, which I write um, in inverted commas, um, because these are frequencies that we write as a function of two integers, L and K. So these are like the analog of the integers characterizing the spherical harmonics. Okay, so here, these are not spherical harmonics. There's something more complicated, but there's analogous integers that, um, for which we have modes which are regular on the sphere, on the rotating sphere in this case. Okay, um, and a slowly rotating limit. If we look at modes which have L equals to K, so for some particular subset of these modes, um, what we'll find from the pole skipping analysis is that there must be dispersion relations um, which pass through these two special points in this you know, Fourier space, if you like, where the frequencies okay, are just set, just give us these two temperatures and the wave numbers just give us the two butterfly velocities. And this, in this slowly rotating limit, uh, things look very similar to the rotating BTZ black hole, um, which have been studied before. So the rotating BTZ black hole has two different growth rates and just one butterfly velocity. That's kind of a speciality of three dimensions. So in four dimensions, you get two different butterfly velocities as well. Um, but I guess the kind of takeaway of this is that um, even in this more complicated example, there's still um, a close connection between uh, the chaotic properties of the quantum field theory um, and just the two point function of energy density. So, this is although we don't have a kind of hydrodynamic theory explaining this in this particular example, I would say this is suggestive that again, for rotating black holes, there is some simple effective theory governing chaos in which just exchange of energy density perturbations um, is creating this, is controlling this um, chaotic behavior. Okay, so I said it wouldn't take half an hour or a minute. Yes. So let me just stop here. Um, so the summary is um, so quasi normal modes are some properties of a black hole space time. And the, you know, the general spectrum depends on exactly which space time is we're talking about. However, just a simple analysis of dynamics near the horizon gives us exact constraints on what the dispersion relations have to be at energies of order to temperature. Or in the language of the quantum field theory, the simple analysis. Um, tells us that we have to have pole skipping points at certain frequencies and certain wave numbers um, in the retarded Green's functions. Now, in a big class of theories with a gravitational description, we find there's always a pole skipping point in the two point function of the energy density whose location is given just by um, tau L and VB, or tau L and VB are just the, the chaotic, you know, the, the parameterized the chaotic growth and decay of four point functions. Okay, and so what is this? The interpretation of this is that this chaotic growth and decay is really all just controlled by dynamics of the energy density. Or conversely, that if we know the chaotic properties, that constrains right, the spectrum of collective modes of energy density. They're not really independent things. Okay, and so there's some other things we, we didn't get a chance to address yet. One of them, and um, as I mentioned, I'm sure this will apply in non ADS space times. And so I'm kind of curious if there's if people are interested in non ADS space times for other reasons, as I alluded to at the start, real black holes and so on. And so I'm curious of whether this kind of analysis can you know, give us any useful information about quasi normal modes of asymptotically flat black holes, for example, that we don't already know. Um, it would be good to have a more direct proof of this applicability of the hydrodynamic origin of chaos. So this, you know, here I've kind of shown by computing. 
the two point function of the energy density correlator, we get something consistent with this effective hydrodynamic theory of chaos. It would be good to have something more direct, like to directly derive this hydrodynamic theory from gravity and see the shift symmetry that we have. Where is that in the gravitational description? Um, Another point I sort of touched on before, can we use these constraints to um, extract or bound individual hydrodynamic coefficients? Um, rather, yeah, almost, yeah, there's been some interesting work on this, as I said. Um, and finally, for the case of the rotating black hole, um, you know, I focus on things um, in the equatorial plane for a large black hole, and this will be rotating limit, because that's where it has some control. But it'd be good to try and figure out what is the what are the form of these correlations away from this kind of nice limit. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, thank you for listening. Sorry for uh, going on a bit. Um, I'll yeah. stop there. Thanks. Questions? I guess also questions for the, the people online can also ask. I guess they just have to unmute themselves. Oh, sure. well, uh, a very nice question. Uh, when you discuss chaotic properties based on the out of order, every discussion of those two things is strange. Yeah. Isn't that strange that you get into the Yeah, I mean, it is a bit. It is a bit strange, yeah. and it's, it's also a bit strange that the yeah the the you know we're also talking about correlation functions of completely different operators, right? One is of an energy density operator, and one is of some generic uh, you know these V and W operators, right? These are right, these are in principle completely different operators, and you would think why would they why would they be related to one another? Um, yeah, and I guess the, the, the interpretation, at least given um, in this paper here, is that, is that yeah, really the, the four point functions um, yeah, in this regime right, can be computed in an effective theory in which right, the, right, the, thing, the thing controlling the exponential growth is just the exchange of, a, right, of, of this dual sigma, and it's just a two point function of sigma. Um, Sorry. Yes. Um, exactly. Yeah. So this this is this is the this is the kind of assumption, if you like. Right. This is the interpretation that the in the, in in this limit where we have large n and maximal chaos, that the four point function is right. Is dominated by a diagram like this in the objective theory. So the only thing that matters is the exchange of this thing. Yeah. 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 Yes. And so that, that's why it looks the same, right? That's why the, yeah, the answer right, is independent of all kinds of detail in these, in these theories because they all boil down. Right. In the limit we're calculating the four point function, all boils down, it's just computing this one back. Yeah, or, I mean, I could say more words, I don't know if this is any more helpful, but in the gravitational calculation, the reason uh, we always get this kind of form is because the gravitational interaction is dominant. So, we're summing some subset of diagrams here, which is basically these things exchanging gravitons. So, in the field theory language, Right, we're saying they're exchanging energy density perturbations. Right. Capturing the exchange so of gravity. That, that calculation sometimes you approximate uh, one way in the background of the other. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so yeah, that's exactly the analog. But the, the, the gravitational interaction can be approximated by replace, yeah, replacing one of these by the stress energy tensor that source these. And the, the field in the field theory language, right, the 
only considering the gravitational interaction means only considering the exchange of this one one operator, which is energy density. 